Once every year, as the summer nears its end, the little traveled roads that are laid over the lonely cap rock mesas of western New Mexico and cut through its broad valleys come to life as they resound with the clatter of wagon wheels, the rhythmic thumping of hooves, and the occasional rumble of a pickup truck. For late summer is the time for the Indian ceremonials held annually at Gallup and attended by representatives of over 30 southwestern tribes. This is a festive occasion, and not only for the Indians themselves. Thousands of white visitors from Maine to California make the trip to Gallup to be on hand for the colorful event that has gained nationwide fame over the years. From the east and the west, white man in his iron horse. From the four corners of the reservation and the many pueblos, red man in covered wagons, and on horseback. As the early sun rises over the mesa on the starting day of the ceremonials, the usually empty, barren, rocky slopes surrounding the ceremonial grounds seem transformed as if by magic into a covered wagon camp. During the night and the early hours before dawn, most of the Indians have arrived. Now they have built little fires to ward off the chill of the night. The squaws set up housekeeping and commence to cook corn, their staple food. Some also put great tin coffee pots to the fire. In the morning hours, late arrivals join those who came during the night. Horses are unhitched and turned loose, their forelegs hobbled so they won't go too far away. They will be fed and watered regularly. The Indian takes very good care of his animals. Small children are left in the sun to play by themselves, but babies are always with their mothers who carry them leashed to a cradle board. During the ceremonial days, the covered wagons must serve as house and home. While the squaws attend to their chores and take care of their small brood, most of the men folk and the older women have hiked up to a higher knoll on the hill, where they sit together in clans, impassively watching the activity below them and quietly waiting for the things to come. Now the time for the parade is at hand. From the hills and the compounds reserved for the performers, the last groups move into the lineup on the outskirts of town. carrying a huge American flag. Many tribes are represented in the parade. Groups of dancers from all the southwestern pueblos, from San Ildefonso and Zuni, from Taos and Higgs, from Acomita and Laguna. There are Apaches from Arizona, and Hopis and Navajos, Sioux from South Dakota, and Cheyennes and Cherokees from Oklahoma. Their kinfolk mingled with the white visitors crowded along the parade route. Against the background of a western band sounds the heavy rhythm of the old drums, the shrill staccato of weird chants incomprehensible to white man. East through the main street of town they move, then west again on Highway 66 and back across the railroad tracks toward the ceremonial grounds. Outside the arena, some take time out for a little social chatter and white man's refreshments before they join the waiting line. Here is one place where a multitude of Indian dialects makes English a minority language. For, as it is with most white people, Indians too love a good show. And this one is their show, an all-Indian affair.
first part of the show is a rodeo. Navajo riders consider themselves second to none in horsemanship, and the young blades have turned out in full force to prove the point. day over, the riders move in a group to one side of the arena. As soon as the dust has settled, the Indians begin their ceremonial dances. Watchfully, the old-timers follow every measured step, every sudden tricky change of rhythm. But these are the same dances and chants that have been performed in sacred rites for centuries, and that are still performed today in the pueblos and remote meeting grounds of the reservations where white man's foot seldom treads. What is Red Man's Dance? To many a casual onlooker, a mere jumping up and down and tramping of feet to the monotonous beat of crudely made drums, or to the rattling of gourds filled with dry seeds. To the Indian, it is a religious ritual. In his war dance, the Apache prays for strength and courage to be victorious in battle. Crouching their bodies, swinging the tomahawk, the dancers glance furtively from side to side, as if they were on the lookout for a lurking enemy. Because it is a sacred ritual, Red Man's Dance is not performed for applause. When a person has fallen ill, the members of his family will call in the crown or devil dancers from a faraway clan. They will arrive by night, preceded by their medicine man, who must see to it that all the preparations are properly made. The dancers must remain unknown to the person for whom the rites are performed. So they wear black, tight-fitting masks as they perform their ceremonial healing prayer. On their heads, they carry crowns decorated with the symbols of the sun, moon, and stars. Their brown bodies are painted with sacred signs. In their hands are swords made of yucca. Their prayers are directed to the forces of nature. Their dance performed to ward off evil spirits. But many things have changed in the life of the Indian. He has made peace with the white man, and being truly tolerant, he has often accepted white man's religion, but he has also continued with his old beliefs and customs. As a result, the strangest rites can sometimes be observed in the pueblos of the southwest, such as Laguna near Albuquerque. There the Pueblo Indians congregate on certain saint days, attend mass in the old Spanish church, and then march in solemn procession around the pueblo, led by the priest and the pueblo governors who carry silver-tipped canes, once given their predecessors by Abraham Lincoln as a sign of office. Behind them, carrying a small statue of the patron saint, come the Pueblo people. After circling the Pueblo, the procession finally winds up at the old plaza, where a shrine of leafy boughs has been erected, and where the image of the saint is deposited. A final brief prayer pays tribute to the god of the white man. To the Indian, every form of worship is good. But now the last amen has sounded, and it is time to invoke the sky powers of old. Suddenly, Seemingly out of nowhere, the eagle dancers have appeared in the plaza. In skin-tight dark suits, a feather cap ending in a beak over their heads, shells tied to their knees, they have begun to dance in carefully rehearsed movements imitating the flight of the great thunderbird. First hopping with bent knees, then slowly rising, slowly raising their arms and spreading their great feather wings, alighting, banking, soaring. 
To the Indian, they are the spirits who can carry to the sky powers the prayer of earthbound man. With a flutter of their powerful wings, the Indians believe, they can call the wind spirits who will bring black thunder clouds and the all-important rain. Now with the eagles dancing, a group of older men enter the plaza, slowly shuffling forward to the severe rhythm of a low-sounding belly drum. They are the chorus that supplies the chant for the corn or rain dance, in which the Pueblo Indians ask for rain for the crops and fertility for their families. Their prayer is addressed to the kachinas, the invisible forces of life that represent the spirit of the ancestors. Legend has it that they are the lost children that slipped from their mother's shoulders on the journey from the center of the earth hundreds of years ago. These are their kachinas, and the figures made of cottonwood and found in every Pueblo home are also kachinas and have the same powers. The men chant in chorus their gestures calling for the clouds to pour rain into the earth, rain that will lift the corn up high. Our arroyos are baked dry from the sun of many days. Our corn bends low under the hot winds in the south. Our medicine man has walked through the fields in the east. He has looked to the north and west, whence the rain must come. And he has spoken that we must have the corn dance. Slowly the dancers move forward, men and women alternating in the line. Men in western shirts with buckskin kirtles and foxtails dangling from their backs with turtle shells or hollow deer hoof rattles tinkling on their legs. The women in festive clothes, wearing their best jewelry with strings of turquoise and coral around their necks, turkey feathers and gourd rattles in their hands. Slowly between the wrapped onlookers, they shuffle back and forth across the dusty plaza, shaking their rattles in fast-changing, complicated rhythm, dancing with insistent, down-pressing stamp, dancing with a firm belief that it will bring the rain to the arid land. A people who have been in a state of transition for a hundred years and more, who have stood on the threshold, yet never crossed it. Let the great Thunderbirds speak for us to the spirit powers. Let them soar to the sky to stop the winds blowing, the winds from the north and west. Let them speak to our kachinas so that their power will become visible through the spirits of the winds and the clouds, the lightning and the rain. Sky powers have heard us. Our water holes are full once more. 
our animals will not suffer from thirst. Our sheep will find the pastures green again. Our corn has been uplifted by our prayers and it stands tall and strong in the wind. Thus, Red Man's dance is also the giving of thanks to the higher powers that have blessed him with all that he has asked for. The dance has brought the water so badly needed for the crops. And now, joyously, they dance again and their gourds rattle rhythmically as they do the corn grinding song. And now the last evening of the ceremonial has come. It is time again to take leave of friends and clan members who may not be met for another year. Some of the Indians have begun to drift away. Most of the others, returning from town or the ceremonial grounds, will stay a part of the night. As darkness comes, the fires burn brightly once more on the hilltops overlooking the arena. For the last time, the performers assemble to greet those who have come from far to see them. From the valley, breaking against the rocks that seem alive with weird dancing shadows from the flickering fires, echoes the sound of the Yevichais, the night chants of the Navajos, the sacred songs whose meaning white man will never know. dawn comes, the hills are bare once more, the Indians gone, strangers in their own land. Gone are their guests, the visitors, until another day, another summer.